country manager, the tech solutions in Mexico. Adelante, Thomas. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, in the program was announced that uh, Henry Trucker will be the speaker today, but unfortunately he got sick, so he couldn't come and I step in and have the pleasure to walk you through this presentation. And, um, well, today and yesterday I visited some, some presentations and I saw many people say, well, seismic is not working very good here in Colombia due to the complexities, the topography and everything. And uh, with this presentation I hope to show you that we can improve the situation of the processing by means of common reflection surface processing. And, um, so, Okay, I want to start and give you an introduction. What is the common reflection surface processing? And you have an idea what we do in this. Next, I want to show you a time imaging example. And um, I will continue with the depth imaging example and finally draw some conclusions of this. Okay, what is common reflection surface processing? Um, we say that this is a fully data-driven approach of seismic processing. That means that all the necessary parameters for enhancing the data are determined from the data itself. And it is a local parameter search at each point of the stack. And uh, the optimal parameters are determined by the best coherency along the surfaces. We will look at that in some minutes. Well, in general, you can say that uh, CRS processing is a generalization of the well-known common midpoint processing that was established back in the 60s. But this method has the drawback that it is, um, strictly speaking, only valid for flat layered geology. So, what did you do to improve this? First, sorry, okay, you introduced the dip into the processing steps. And uh, this led to the invention of the DMO processing at the beginning of the 90s. But still, um, this is not a very good approximation of the subsurface because you need also account for the curvature of the reflectors. And when you do that, you end up with the common reflection surface processing, which was developed in Germany by Professor Huber in the late 90s. And, um, well, here, one more time, for repeat for everybody, the typical setup for a uh, CMP situation. We have a source, we have a reflect receiver here, and we have some wave traveling. And from this uh, simple geometric situation, you end up in deriving and describing your travel times that you need for your reflection to travel to the receiver. Um, you can describe this time by this equation here, the NMO equation. <coughs> and this is dependent mainly on this velocity parameter, the spectral velocity. Now, in the CRS, we are taking more parameters into account, which we derive completely from the wave field that we receive on the, in the reflectors. One is, we measure the angle of incidence with which, with which the wave is traveling to the surface and is recorded. And this angle can be directly related to the dip angle of your reflector and the subsurface. Next is, um, we look at some waves that we uh, measure at the surface, and one is called the normal incidence point wave, because the assumption is that this is generated by a point source at your reflector. And the other is, that you don't have a point source, but more a receiving, uh, reflecting element here sitting at the reflector. And this wave is called the normal wave. And um, in the CRS, we are essentially measuring the curvatures of these detected waves for the MIP wave and for the normal wave. The reason is that from this curvature of the mid wave, you get information about the depth of your reflector. And from the normal wave, 
you can uh, have information about the shape or the curvature of your reflecting elements, of your reflecting in the subsurface. And um, from all of these parameters, with some math, you can end up with a CRS travel time formula that looks like this. It's rather complicated. And this contains all the three parameters that I just described. Well, in 2D they are three, in 3D they are also the aerodynamic components, so we really have three eight parameters to determine. <coughs> and moreover, you also have a delta x here in the equation, and this is what we call the midpoint aperture. And this is an important parameter in the CRS because um, this determines um, the power of noise reduction that you get. Um, for example, this is described here in this diagram, a 3D setup with a total of 60 traces, and you are interested in your center bit here in the red. When we choose a midpoint aperture of, for example, 75 meters, we are essentially looking in the CRS algorithm and all these green bins here around your center bin. And this gives us the power to look at almost 3,000 pre-stack traces to determine the signals that are here in your center bin. And this gives us um, the ability with the CRS to significantly improve the signal-to-noise ratio in the data and you get a better continuity at the end. <clears throat> okay, let's look at some uh, examples and I want to start with a time migration example from a Colombian data set here. This is a 2D line and um, we have the typical, typical problems here for Colombia. We have heavy topography and um, in this data set we also have somewhere here sitting a major fault system and this has a high velocity contrast. For this, here in the marked section, we have a heavy shadow zone. And um, the challenge of the reprocessing that we did for Echo Patrol was if we can improve this zone. And uh, so we reprocessed this data and applied the CRS to it. And after that, we migrated it with the cage of time migration. And the result is shown here. So here in the basin part, you really see not a big change. But here in the interesting area, which is the shadow zone of the fall, you really start seeing now that you get all these nice reflectors here. And you can define here the football of the fault. Moreover, you get a better picture of more or less where would be the fault line here and this would be here the hanging wall block. <coughs> so this is a really nice example what we can achieve with the CRS processing in this complicated area. The next thing that we did, okay, um, maybe we can even do better if we apply depth migrations to this data set. So we set out to test this and um, we started by using the final time migration velocity. We converted them by a Dix conversion. Additionally, we had information available by EcoPetrol. They gave us the model that they have of the geology. And essentially we combined this information we created an initial velocity model and this model we put into a tomography update loop and um, we iterated until we sufficiently had flat image gathers which is the usual approach to do this and we end up with a depth migration that looks like this this is a case of preset depth migration result with the CRS gathers as input and uh, yeah, when you recall the time migration result, it looks pretty similar. Here, this is all no problem. And then here, where you have the shadow zone problem, 
you see that um, with the cage of migration, well, this is really not a good result. When you have all this noise going here, that is crossing the reflections that you really want to see and that you are interested in. So we can conclude that a ray-based migration is not, not a good choice for this setting. <clears throat> so the next step that we did, okay, let's turn to a wave migration and we applied an RTM algorithm to this data set and the result is shown here. And what you can see is that the RTM is much cleaner here in your shadow zone. So you really see all the reflectors coming up here. You see that they terminate here, where we would say there somewhere has to be the fault line going through. And if you can see here in the hanging wall some reflections that have a, has a different direction. So you see here would be the call somewhere. But the question is, um, can we do better than that? Um, the bad news is, with uh, tomography, you are lost in this, in this zone. The tomography works here. This is very easy, but here, when you, I don't have the gathers here, unfortunately, but the gathers are really poor in this part. Even if we have, um, we have the availability of RTM gathers, but even they, you cannot use them for a, for some inversion because you hardly see any mover, so this would be unreliable updating. So we thought, okay, we can try and scan that area with constant velocity migrations. And this is, um, I show you some results here. We started with a velocity of 4,500 meters in all this left part of the section. The velocity is constant. And when we walk through the migrations, 4,700, 4,900, and then suddenly we see something forming here, this reflection. And when I further increase, 5,001, 53, you see that we are losing that. By five. So for this <coughs> was our conclusion. Okay, then we use a velocity of 4,900 because we see this nice reflection here, and then we use this for trying to interpret it. So the fault would be somewhere here sitting, and the next step is um, okay. We modified the velocity model. We put here inside the hanging wall block with this constant velocity of 4,900 meters per second. And here, all the rest, we kept the model that, I, that we saw before from the tomographies. And let's see what happens. <coughs> so, uh, one more time for the comparison. This is the RTM that I showed before with the pure tomography model. And when we insert the block, we see that we get some significant changes here in the <coughs> area of the shadow zone where is the football located. We are now seeing here the better termination of these events. They are going further into this zone and we are better delineating this fault here. Um, moreover, we can see that here in this hanging block, we see some elements that are coming in this direction, which gives us confidence that uh, well, here the evolution would be up to like this, and we would have here elements coming like this, which are separated here. And um, yeah. Here is one more time for orientation, the fault included. And this would be, a look at the velocity model, this is the tomography model that we used. And we ended up producing this kind of model. 
So we are seeing basically that structures that are coming from here, they are over thrusted and turn around here to form this block here. And I think that's a pretty, pretty interesting result. <coughs> Well, yes, to conclude, um, I presented a workflow that is significantly improving the seismic imaging in, for example, this challenging overthrust zone. And the major steps were that we used the common reflection surface processing to significantly improve the signal noise ratio of the seismic data. The next is you would want to go for a depth migration in this setting and then you, you would choose a reverse time migration because with the Kirchhoff you cannot uh, <coughs> handle these problems of complexity. And another major factor was <coughs> our close cooperation with our clients from Echo Patrol because um, as I mentioned tomography works to some certain point in these settings but when, you get, when it gets really complicated, you have to rely on interpretation, um, working together with the geologists to determine the best possible model that fits the situation. And this is meant here by integrated model building approach. And yeah, that's basically it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the permission to show the data. So, if you have any questions, go ahead. Preguntas para Tom. Preguntas para Tom.